You ready? Yeah. All right. High school kids at this time, get on up out of here. Good job, Joe. Rachel, thank you very much. She didn't leave, did she? Whew, you said one more. <laughs> thank you very much for filling in for Kara today. Kara is uh, at a concert this weekend in Louisville, big country concert. I don't know, Tim McGraw and little big something. Yeah. Uh, Dwight Yoakam, I knew that name. Yeah. Um, so she's down there enjoying that, and Rachel just did a fine job filling in for her. Thank you very, very much for that. Can talk about uh, the crosswalk today. What does that even mean? Well, you'll find out shortly, of course. A little bit different type of sermon today than you're probably used to hearing me uh, preach, but I hope that you get something out of it. Nonetheless, when you think about a crosswalk, of course, you might be thinking about just walking across the street. And of course, we're not talking about that today. Uh, maybe you're thinking about your walk of faith, your walk with Jesus, uh, carrying that cross, picking up your cross and following him, uh, like the scriptures say. And we'll talk about that later as well. But really, when we look at the cross, I think it's important that we understand that even though we have the responsibility to follow Jesus on that journey, he carried our cross for us. And make no mistake about that. But what is this cross then? Like, th this is one of those things that just you really got to stop and think about. Because when, when we see crosses throughout our world, like I, I remember one time a few years back, I, I can't remember if it was Levi or Jonah, we were watching a TV show and they saw in the background of whatever uh, drama scene was going on that there was a cross in this person's house and they said look dad the person's a Christian see they got a cross in their house and I unfortunately had to say not necessarily not necessarily putting a cross on your wall or I wore one around my neck for years and years and years on a chain that doesn't make you a Christian but it's a good reminder for us right of our of our faith and there's nothing wrong with that but it takes more than just wearing that around your neck to really be able to say I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I follow him and oftentimes we see these ornamental type crosses and have y'all ever seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade I, most of you probably have seen that movie some years ago and they're trying to find that 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 cup that um, what do they call it the Holy Grail yeah I was thinking Monty Python wrong movie right <laughs> trying to find that, that holy grail and they, they pick up the golden one and uh, what does he say that's not the right choice you've chosen poorly and then finally they pick up the, the cup that would have been more accurately of what would have been used in that situation which I'm not even sure that you know that's not scriptural uh, but it was just a, a poor carpenter's cup and we think about the cross of Jesus y'all they didn't hang our savior to die on a cross like that it would have been something more along these lines in the old, wooden, it was, it was not a good thing. It was uh, humiliating. It was a curse. Now, this verse isn't on the screen, so just stay here for a minute for me, Mount Neva. But Galatians 3.13, if you want to write that down, I'm just going to read it real quick. It says, But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law when he was hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing, for it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And that's a, a pr prophetic verse from, from Deuteronomy. This cross is a curse. It's humiliating. That's what our Lord had to endure. That's what he had to suffer for you and for me and for all who, who would accept him. It's humiliating. And what did he do that for though? For you, for me. First Peter 2.24, this one is on the screen. It goes right along those same lines as Galatians. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. That deserves an amen. amen. By his wounds you're healed. So that we can be dead to sin. And this is the reoccurring theme throughout today's sermon. And I'll just get it started right now. You see, that cross, it should not represent death for us anymore. Because it was at that cross that death was defeated. Something died that day on that cross, though. And it was our sins. The cross of Jesus, very specifically, is where this would happen. 
Now, think about this for a minute. Why the cross? Now, I, that, that can be answered very, very simply because that's when Jesus came to our earth. That's the, the device they were using to kill people, to execute people. And it was probably one of the worst of all the history of our world. There would have been times where instead of a cross, it may have been a noose or burned at the stake or guillotine or firing squad or gas chamber or the electric chair. Now think about that for a second. Can you imagine if Christ had come during an era when one of those devices was used? Well, first of all, every one of those is going to be a lot quicker than this cross was going to be. A lot less painful than this cross was going to be. But if he had come and, and had a guillotine, would we hang guillotines around our neck now? Would we have electric chairs on our walls? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have crosses on your walls around your neck. It's a good reminder for us of what happened with our Savior. I'm just saying, think about what this cross actually represents, what it was actually used for. I can tell you this much. The cross is nothing, is nothing without Christ's sacrifice. And if it wasn't for what Christ Jesus did on that day, for you and for me, we would look at this as one of the worst torture devices that would lead to death of all the history of the world. But instead, this cross of Jesus is where we can find the ultimate sacrifice paid for us. And that is where our faith walk should begin. When we realize that it took Jesus dying for our sins. See, if you're a Christian and you tell me you don't think you need Jesus then you have been going in the wrong direction with your faith. See, because you need Him today, and you need Him yesterday, and you're going to need Him tomorrow. We're sinners. And the, the first point that you realize, hey, I'm a sinner and I need help, you realize that points to the cross. Or that old rugged cross. And that's where we're going to start today. We're going to talk about some of these songs. In front of you, if you want to follow along today, you've got one of these books. We rarely use them, even though I'm told you did a few weeks ago. And uh, you'll find the Old Rugged Cross on page 186. If you want to kind of look at the words while we talk about it today. And you don't have to, but I know some of y'all might want to. Now, this song was written after the author, whose name's George Bernard. More about him in a minute. After he contemplated over and over in his mind, he was, he was a preacher, but he, he contemplated this verse. You've probably heard of it. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now again, think about this, because we got to look at this verse deeper sometimes. Now this is Jesus telling Nicodemus, who was a, a Pharisee, a teacher, someone who was on, on the high council. This is Jesus teaching this guy, who would have been much older than him, and, and more educated, formally. And Jesus is telling him, again prophetically, that God gave his one and only son. And that's real easy for us to think God gave it, his son to us by sending him to earth. Because Christ's life on earth is important. It had to happen. We, we learned from him. But that's not just how God gave his son. God gave us his son not only to teach us, but also to die for us. George Bernard, this is a guy. Uh, can you imagine wearing suits like that, Dad? <laughs> I mean, neither. Yeah. This guy really had contemplated on this verse before he wrote this song. He was praying for a full understanding of what the cross meant and its plan in Christianity whenever he wrote this. He was in Pacagon, uh, Michigan. Uh, that's, there's a stone in Pacagon, Michigan that uh, commemorates the first time that this uh, song was sang and, um, because he did it early on in his ministry. And I guess he went on from there to Reed City, Michigan, where this cross stands, I believe still to this day. And I don't know for sure if it's still there, but uh, uh, 
The internet says it is, so if you read it on the internet, it must be true, right? So I didn't go check or nothing like that. Uh, but to commemorate this song, which became one of the most famous songs, hymns, written. And it was written in 1913, one of the most famous ones. Like, we, we love this song, right? This was my favorite as a kid growing up. I don't even know if I can tell you why. Maybe I just like the tune. But when you really start thinking about what it means now... That's where we really got to dwell on some of these hymns, I think. It's not just a matter of repeating the same old things that we always heard when we were kids growing up from the hymn book. Do you understand what these words mean? It's theological. The Old Rugged Cross says that it is an emblem of suffering and shame. That's suffering that Christ took for us. The shame that he took away from us and bore himself on that cross. What, what does emblem mean? A symbol. It's a symbol. And when we really think about what the cross, the symbol of it might mean, torture, death, injustice, because Christ certainly didn't deserve it. And like I've already said, humiliation. This symbol ever, it doesn't make us Christians. Faith in Jesus Christ, who died on that cross, is what makes us Christians. So I say be careful. Be careful not to worship the cross. Now that might sound kind of strange, right? But if we start worshiping an inanimate object, that is something that God has warned us about. Amen. It's idolatry. Be careful not to worship the cross. We only worship God. But that, that emblem, though, I think the rest of the song says it. Because what does it remind us of? It reminds us of our God. The song goes on to say that we're going to cherish that old rugged cross. We're going to cling to to that old rugged cross and that we're going to have that crown someday because we're going to trade in that cross. And why? Why do we cherish it? Why do we cling to it? Because that's where we were offered salvation. So we're going to cling to that fact and cling to the fact that our walk with Jesus starts there. And where does that walk lead? It leads us to the crown. It's that cross, it's not ours to bear. Because Christ bared it for us, bore it for us. But it is our cross to walk with Jesus. Right? Again, an illustration. Imagine this. When Jesus was walking on, 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 up to Calvary Hill to be crucified, and he was carrying his, his cross... And he would eventually get help from uh, Simon. But he's carrying that cross. Now imagine yourself walking next to him. Knowing that he has your cross. Knowing that he is carrying what you deserve. But instead he's taking it for you. Because I believe that's how we should be with our, with our walk of faith. As we, as we strive to follow that path of righteousness. We should know that Christ is right there beside us and he's still holding that cross for us. He's already paid that price. But he didn't stay on that cross, so did he? And let's never forget that. But he sure did take it for us. At the cross is where that happened. You can turn over to hymn 188 if you want to. The, the name of this song is actually Alas and Did My Savior Bleed. And there's a reason why we call it at the cross, because this is kind of written over a couple different centuries. But let's contemplate this verse for a minute. Galatians 2.20 My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. The, the hymn, the verses of this, were written by one of my favorite old hymn writers, um, Sir Isaac Watts, in 1707. 
He's also uh, the, the author of We're Marching to Zion. And I, I've told you the story about We're Marching to Zion before, but just in case, I'll give you it real briefly. This guy, he was struggling with his church. They were a congregational, so they were independent uh, over in England, uh, independent like we are. Right? So they didn't have like a governing body um, out, outside of their own walls. And his church family that he was the preacher of was struggling because they had conflict about whether they should be singing songs or these newfangled songs that are just not even the same that were at the time called hymns. Now you see the reversal of that. Now we would say we have our old hymns. Back then, hymns was a brand new concept. Before then, they only sang the songs. So what he decided to do was split his service instead of making it blended and having everyone get along. So at the beginning of the service, they'd sing the songs. Then he would give the message. Then at the end of the service, they'd sing these new hymns for the younger hip crowd, right? And what, what happened, though? After they would sing the psalms, he would have his sermons, and then anybody that wasn't into these new hymns would stand up and walk out of the church. Isaac Watts did not take kindly to this, nor should he have. So he wrote the song, We're Marching to Zion, to say, hey, we should all be in this together. We're all going to the same spot, right? But he also wrote the song, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. And when we look at the verses on this one, we see a lot of times we're singing just a couple verses from hymns, right? And, and a lot of times it doesn't matter. But sometimes verse 1 leads to verse 2, leads to verse 3, and finally concludes with verse 4, kind of, kind of getting you on the path of or, or the story. And this is a classic example. As he contemplates the cross, the first thing he sees is sorrow. He's, he's, he's just really upset that Christ had to die. Then the second thing that you see through verse 2 is that he's ashamed. He's ashamed because now he realizes that Christ had to die for him. But then in verse 3 we start to see him realize and he's amazed at how powerful our God is that he would do this for us. And finally it comes full circle and in verse 4 we see that he is thankful this is probably something that we should maybe go through every day of our lives when we really truly contemplate that cross, isn't it? We should be sorry that we, we, we failed. We failed. We should be ashamed of that. But we should also be amazed and most certainly thankful that Jesus Christ offered you forgiveness on that cross and that God rose him from the dead. When we think about that, though, it gets into the, uh, the, the course. And you saw the picture of the other guy up there. His name was Ralph Hudson. Uh, and, and I got this written down right here. Just my handwriting is awful. Um, oh, 1885, Ralph Hudson wrote the chorus to that song. It, it was originally only those four verses. And he wrote the chorus, which they said would have probably been a lot in the camp meetings. And, of course, we know that as at the cross. At the cross where I first saw the light. Where the burden of my heart was rolled away. Where we realize that the cross isn't where it ends for us, but rather where it begins. It was there by faith that I received my sight. Now, not literally being able to see here, right? but being able to see that it is Christ Jesus who is Lord and the only way that we can be with God someday. The only way to heaven. And yes, I know I push that like every time I preach, right? But, and I'm telling you why. Because I see today's world. And in today's world, more and more often you see kids and people and, and media and just the world in general saying, oh, there's multiple ways to heaven. That wake up and see the light, y'all. Because we as Christians, we can't have that viewpoint. There is no way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Christ did not come in the form of anything else other than Jesus Christ. In other words, Christ wasn't also Buddha. Christ wasn't Muhammad. That, that is ludicrous. Like People who say that to you have not done anything other than hoped for something that is absolutely not true. Now, look, I'm not trying to, to bash our friends or, or our family or our people we know that might think that way. But folks, that's what it is. They, you can't tell me that you believe in Jesus Christ and don't read the Bible, don't know what it says, 
This right here, it tells us about Christ. You know, the whole Old Testament leads us to Jesus Christ. And the New Testament tells us the story of His miraculous birth, of His awesome life, of the miracles that He performed, of the prophecies that He fulfilled, of the death He endured on the cross, and of His resurrection. And then the rest of it's all about the new church and how they're serving Him and worshiping Him. Just because we hope, just because we think, oh man, there must be so many different paths to heaven that doesn't make it true. Because you can't say, I believe in Jesus unless you believe in the Jesus that isn't the Jesus of the Bible. Because our Lord is very clear. There is no way except through me. So we got to see that light. And that, that's where we've got to really be able to say, when, when we can see it, when we know what our faith means, and we know our responsibility to share it, the end of that song says, and now I am happy all the, the days, right? Is that what it says, are all the way? Okay. Uh, you, it sounds like you're all saying the same thing. I don't know. It's, you're happy is the point, right? <laughs> or joyful always. I think that's a better way to put it, y'all, because who here is happy all the time? Let me tell you something. I was watching football last week, watching the, the, the Cincinnati Houday Bengals, and at the end of that game, I was not happy. That was a bad call, Brophy. I'm sorry, it was. It was a bad call. <laughs> wasn't, I wasn't necessarily happy, but there's a difference between happy and joy, because really when we take that silly stuff out of the equation, because there is silly things that make us unhappy sometimes, let's face it. But I better still have the joy in my heart. I better still got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. I better still have that and I better still be living it every single day of my life because I saw the light at that cross the day that Jesus died for me. So let's be joyful always. We've got a reason to be. Because we know that the way of the cross is going to lead home. That's 471 if you want to turn over to that. And I read a little bit of that one earlier. Colossians 1.20 is a verse that Miss Pounds would use as she wrote the words to this song. Back in 1906. It says, through him, that's being Jesus, if we were to look at the previous verses, um, through Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That's awesome stuff, y'all. I mean, I hope you realize it. Through Christ, that's how we're reconciled. And that's how it leads home. Jesse Brown Pounds. This, this one, I had to use this song because this one holds a dear place to, to my heart. Because Jesse Brown Pounds was a member of the independent Christian church just like you and I. And she would eventually marry the preacher of Central Christian Church over in Indianapolis. But from 1885 to 1896 for 11 years, she was one of the editors for the magazine called The Christian Standard. Now The Christian Standard was a, 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 a magazine that would go out to every Christian church for hundreds of years until probably the last decade. And things got changed up there. It was based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, Jessie was from Cleveland area. We won't hold that against her too much, though. <laughs> but she, she wrote the, the song in 1906 while her husband was preaching over in Indiana. She wrote the song, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. See, there's no other way except the way of the cross. That's what the, the verses say to that. It leads home. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must pick up your, uh, own, your cross, uh, pick up your own, I'm sorry, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. It leads home. Charles Gabriel, who would have been the songwriter for the, the song, she wrote the words, all right, the people I'm telling you about, they wrote the words to these songs. Sometimes they wrote the music too. Uh, but Charles Gabriel was the music writer. Very talented man. And he said this about the intent that she had with this song. It was to give emphasis to the truth that heroic Christianity does not follow the path of least resistance. So when we talk about picking up our cross and following Jesus, that giving up our own way, 
and picking up our cross and follow Jesus, I got good news for you. You don't have to go and put that cross on a hill and be hung on it and have nails driven through your hands because Christ did that for you. But what that means for us is that it's not always easy. And it's certainly not following the path of least resistance. Sometimes it's hard to do the right thing and to be selfless. Finally today we come to the song Down at the Cross. There's another name we call this. I'll get to that in a minute. But that's on 527 and you're going to know it right away. When you get to 527 you're going to see glory to his name. That's what we know this song as. Uh, but, it's, but it's actually entitled uh, Down at the Cross. It was written in 1878 by uh, a Presbyterian minister named E.A. Hoffman. He is, uh, was a well-known hymn writer. Uh, sometimes he would write the music as well, but mostly the, the words. He also wrote uh, two songs that I know you're familiar with, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Have you ever heard of that one? And Are You Washed in the Blood? But down at the cross, that leads to that refrain. And that's where we're heading here as we come to a close. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, Thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over sin and death. Amen? So let's remember the cross for sure. And what it means, Christ's suffering, his sacrifice, his atoning sacrifice for us, his death. But the cross doesn't represent our death. And quite honestly, the cross doesn't represent Jesus' death because he defeated that, didn't he? But the cross to us represents death to sin. And it represents the, just the first part of our victory. Because if you ask me, I think there's a better symbol for our faith. And it just doesn't work as good as that cross. I think it should be this. This next slide. I said glory to his name. Yes, that cross, he died. But that tomb shows us that death was defeated. We have a responsibility, and I don't think we should call it a crosswalk. Because that's just the beginning. I think we should call it a resurrection walk. Now, we have, when we give our lives to Christ, we're baptized. Let's think about what that means for a second. It means that we are dying to sin, but we're living for Him. When we come up out of that water, we receive that, that gift of the Holy Spirit, that extra little bit in your heart that's going to remind you that you're following Jesus. When we come up out of that water, we have a new life. When you get the same earthly body, that's not going to change. But you have a new life, a life where your sin has been paid for on that cross. And then you have responsibility. A responsibility to walk the path of righteousness. To walk with Him. And to live a resurrected life. This empty tomb reminds me of that. An image of, of my faith. An image of victory. I say praise God. I say thank you Jesus. And I say glory to His name. Thank you, Lord, for your life, for your death on that nasty old cross. But today we say thank you for your resurrection. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for all you gave to us, more than we could ever truly imagine or fathom when you gave your Son because you loved us and you wanted us to, to be able to come home because he laid that path for us. We thank you, Lord, for the life that we have and the responsibility that we need to uphold by living that resurrected life. Lord, we can't thank you enough for your Son. 
who went through all of that pain and agony for us. Help us to show our thankfulness for how we live every single day of our lives. Lord, just now I ask a blessing upon our church and our church family. Help us to have a resurrection walk. And in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you all please stand for our hymn of decision, hymn of opportunity. If today is the day that you're ready to start your crosswalk, do not hesitate to come down this aisle as we sing.